Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's event, uh, today's IIED debates event, making finance flow for locally led action in the decade of action. Um, we are really delighted to be co-hosting uh, this Stockholm Plus 50 associated event today with the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. My name is Juliette, I'm the events officer at IIED and I'll be providing uh, some technical support as we go through the event today. Um, I can see the participant count is uh, steadily moving upwards, which is great. So welcome to everyone who's just joining. And um, while we wait just a moment or so for a few more participants to join, I will um, run through how um, we're gonna use the Zoom um, features today and how you can engage in the event today. We really wanna hear from, from all of you. That's all for me on housekeeping, uh, which means I now have the delightful job of introducing Ebony Holland, um, who's the senior researcher at IIED and lead author on the new paper that's being launched today and we're discussing. Um, Ebony will tell you all about that. Um, and Ebony is also moderating our discussion today. I'll hand over to you, Ebony. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Juliet. It's so great to have everyone here. A very, very warm welcome to you all um, to this event on making finance flow for locally led action in the decade of action. As Juliet mentioned, this event is co-hosted by IIED and CEDA, and it is also an associated event to Stockholm Plus 50, which kicks off next week. My name is Ebony Holland. As Juliet said, I'm the Nature Climate Policy Lead at IIED, and it's my great pleasure to be your moderator for this event. And as Juliet also said, I'm, I'm one of the authors of the report that will be launched during this event, and I'll introduce that in a moment. But before I do, I want to thank our fantastic speakers for making the time to be with us today. I will introduce each of them as they come to speak shortly, um, but they'll be bringing a really diverse range of perspectives um, from small scale men and women farmers, uh, wildlife conservation and communities from global funds, multilateral development banks, and from governments as well. You can see on the slide the speakers that we have with us today. So a huge welcome to our speakers also for making this event possible. In terms of format, we will hear a series of short presentations from our speakers followed by a moderated Q&A session. So do get your questions ready in the Q&A function below and, and upvote those that you would like to hear answered. There will also be an audience poll so we can hear directly from you as well. But the purpose of this event is to launch a new report. And Juliet, if I could have the next slide, that would be fantastic. We're here today to um, launch this new report, Money Where It Matters for People, Nature and Climate, driving change through support for local level decision-making over resources and finance. The report was commissioned by CEDA and produced by IIED ahead of Stockholm Plus 50 next week. The report was written by myself and three IIED colleagues, Sedril Patel, Phyllis Rowe and Claire Shakia. And I know we have a couple of the authors on, um, in the audience today as well, so a huge welcome to Claire and to Dillis. Our first speaker, Eureka, will talk a bit more about Stockholm Plus 50 and why this event is so critical. But from IIED's perspective, and certainly this is what we, we get to in this report, a mark of success for the high level meeting next week will be if it can lead to stronger political ambition for locally led action. Um, we really want to see this highlighted in the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting report and, and to really drive this agenda forward throughout the decade of action. And really our report is getting to that exact issue. As we outline in the report, sufficient levels of finance are not reaching the local level to support outcomes for people, nature and climate. As many here would already know, national and global actors still control much of that finance and decision making. And, and this is highly problematic, as we know, because it limits the agency and influence that local actors, such as Indigenous peoples, local communities, women, youth and others, have over how this money is spent. It also means that the wealth of local, intergenerational, Indigenous, traditional and cultural knowledge and experience can be missing from the decision making processes too. So from our perspective, and noting the decades of, of progress that have been made on sustainable development since 1972, Stockholm Plus 50 provides an opportunity to reflect and to change this and put us on a pathway where locally led action is really central to delivering sustainable development outcomes. Um, and also next, next week, Stockholm Plus 50 leaders, um, as well as highlighting locally led action through their discussions and in the meeting report, can also set the tone for other big meetings coming up this year, such as COP15, COP27, and others even into next year. So next week really is a critical moment for this journey. 
In terms of the report itself, uh, I just want to highlight the five recommendations that we put forward in this report. The, the recommendations draw heavily from the principles for locally led adaptation and also years of research by IIED, our partners, and many others. Uh, and you can see the recommendations on the slide. They are to, so to enable more locally led action for people, nature and climate. The recommendations are to increase the quantity, improve the quality and strengthen the transparency of finance flows, to simplify access to the finance, to prioritize equitable governance of the finance, to strengthen investments in national and local institutions, including to build national delivery mechanisms to get finance to the local level. And then a really important cross-cutting fifth recommendation to tackle the underlying drivers of vulnerability and recognize the value of coherent responses to the triple crisis of nature, of climate, nature, and poverty in finance and all decisions. From our side, we believe that addressing these recommendations will go a substantial way to reforming the finance system and to enabling more locally led action for people, nature and climate. And before I hand over to Eureka, I just want to point out that the report itself um, acknowledges that the changes, the shift that's needed is a whole of society shift. Uh, the report specifically focuses on four audience groups and, and provides recommendations for those. The four audience groups are government, multilateral development banks, global funds, and what we call international intermediaries, which are those middle actors that sit between global financial institutions and governments or communities, and often manage the implementation of the funding. They could be international organizations, um, public or private organizations, and also civil society groups. So those are the four key actors that we're um, targeting through this report. And so with this in mind, uh, and with the recommendations here, I really invite you to read the report, to reflect on the recommendations and to identify what you could do within your role, uh, within your network and your advocacy for Stockholm Plus 50 and beyond this year to really push to get more finance and decision making to the local level. Uh, we will come back to the report during the discussion, but for now, I'd really like to invite Eureka Orkason, the lead policy specialist for environment and climate change at CEDA, to provide some opening remarks before we turn to our speakers. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ebony. Um, <clears throat> and I would really like to start by thanking IID for the close collaboration on the excellent report, which is formally launched today. Uh, and the report uh, is totally in line with CEDA's vision, every person's right and opportunity to live a decent life and leave no one behind. I think that Conclusions in the report will guide and strengthen our work ahead, uh, not least from a rights-based approach. And we all know that challenges to attaining sustainable development are significant and they're complex and often interlinked. And that is why we are instructed to integrate five central perspectives throughout the Swedish Development Corporation. The perspectives of people living in poverty, gender equality and the human rights-based approach and also environment and the conflict perspective. In this case, I think the human rights-based approach is essential when we talk about locally-led action with assuring participation, equality and transparency, accountability in everything we do. And this goes for all our work uh, beyond, beyond just environment and climate change at CEDA. And we will definitely look at the recommendations in the report directed at us as donors from this perspective and I sincerely hope that governments and multilateral development banks and global funds who have the power to drive change through support for local level decision making over resources and finance do the same. Uh, but I would like to also say some words on Stockholm Plus 50 since, since it is around the corner and uh, very relevant for this work. Uh, CEDA sees Stockholm Plus 50 as an important opportunity for our partner organizations to demonstration, demonstrate and discuss solutions that will help us reach the targets set out under Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. And for our partner countries to explore ways uh, to achieve the same goals, including ways to access uh, increased finance. And uh, the decade of action, Ebony mentioned that, calls for accelerating sustainable solutions to all the world's biggest challenges, ranging from poverty and gender to climate change, inequality and closing the 
uh, finance gap. And already in 2019, the UN Secretary General called on all sectors of society to mobilize for a decade of action on three levels, global, local and people action uh, to generate unstoppable movement, pushing for required transformations. And CETA works to contribute to, contribute to the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on development financing. And I think we need to make sure that public financing is catalyzing large scale climate and nature financing from all sources, not least the private sector. And the report we will discuss today is important in this context and also uh, related to the need for financing to reach the local level and to have local actors in the driving seat. Then I would just also like to mention some words on the, the principles for locally led adaptation that CEDA signed just before COP26 and that are mentioned in the report. And CEDA provides core support to IID and has in this way also contributed to the development of eight principles for locally led adaptation and supports them. And these eight principles have been fundamental components of Swedish development cooperation uh, for a significant period of time already. And uh, we are supporting various locally led adaptation initiatives and committed to facilitate inclusive locally led adaptation and uh, nature finance in vulnerable contexts. And the endorsement of the principles for locally led adaptation has proven a very important step in this direction. And supporting other actions to move forward in this area is, is important, really important for us. And we are heavily involved in the work, as an example, by OECD DAC, uh, where we support the joint efforts between Environnet and Governet to thematic networks where the recent focus has been on how localization happens in the adaptation domain and to what extent it has resulted in effective, inclusive and durable agreements for localized adaptation governance. But we also support various programs, important to mention in this context. Just to give you one example, uh, we do in cooperation with the World Bank uh, support uh, government of Kenya in an initiative financing locally led climate action called Flocka. And it is actually the first national scale model, model of devolved climate finance. But there are many more uh, that I won't go into here, but I would be happy to share experiences from those uh, later on today or outside this event. Uh, but we see really uh, the urgent need to do more for outreach to local level with active participation and ownership from local actors, such as local governments, but also local communities. Uh, and our experience tells us, and this report I think demonstrates, that active involvement and participation at the local level creates better and more long-term results. But we also need to face the risks and challenges in decentralization processes, where ownership is key and systems might not always be in place, and it can be those in greatest needs that who can't absorb money in the way foreseen. So that also needs to be dis debated, discussed and, and looked at. And I think all actors need to have more of a local level lens and the institutional frameworks at national, regional and uh, global levels uh, are important in this work. All uh, these, different actors need to put on that local lens in, in the work ahead. And at CEDA, we have lots of tools and possibilities at hand since we work with bilateral, regional and thematic strategies, not the least through our global strategies, but also through our civil society strategies. Uh, and I'm sure that we can learn and improve our work when cooperating with other donors and, uh, and, and also other actors in this work to constantly improve. And I am convinced that the, the report we will discuss today with its recommendations uh, that Ebony just um, went through will help us all with our different roles and responsibilities to move in the direction of exploring the role of locally led action uh, for people, nature and climate, and propose uh, recommendations for governments and multilateral development banks and global funds to drive change through this support for local level decision-making over resources and finance. 
and not the least at Stockholm Plus 50. So really looking forward to the discussion we will have today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eureka. That was such a great um, opening remark. Um, there's so much that you touched on that I'd like to explore. And maybe we'll do that a little bit later once we, we bring you back into the Q&A. But I also did really want to highlight your point around um, you know, climate finance providers, including governments, facing the risks and challenges that come with the types of things that we're talking about around decentralizing um, finance and decision making to the local level. And hopefully we can touch on that a little bit more shortly. And certainly both CEDA and the Netherlands who are on this call are endorsers of the principles that you referred to. And indeed, you know, the support that, that we and others received from CEDA were fundamental to developing um, the principles themselves. So we'll get the chance to talk about that a little bit more later today. Um, but thank you so much, Eureka. Um, so with that, folks, I'd like to move us into um, the next phase of this discussion. And it is honestly just such a, a delight to have two speakers now to, to talk to us about their experiences working with local communities, um, really pushing for more locally led action in their own contexts. I would first like to invite uh, Esther Panunia, Secretary General of the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, to speak on the importance of getting finance to the local level including sports, small scale men and women farmers in, in Asia. Over to you, Esther. Thank you, Ebony, and good morning to everyone. And we thank the organizers of this event in inviting us to share our perspective here. And thank you, Ebony, for that very important question. And we can firmly and categorically say it is very, very important to get money down to the local level because the actions, the very important actions are done at the local level with people who are key stakeholders whose very lives depend on the situation and conditions of their environment. We all know that family farmers rely on agriculture for a living and agriculture relies heavily on weather and climate, on nature, our lands, terrain, soils, waters and forests, on biodiversity and unpredictable weather patterns, terrible typhoons, droughts, salinity, environmental degra degradation, poor soil health, biodiversity loss, all this has seriously and negatively impacted on our yields and harvests, and therefore our incomes, our health and nutrition, and even our sense of dignity as farmers. That is why the poorest and hungriest people in the world are those in the rural areas and rely on agriculture for a living. And since family farmers produce as much as 80% of food globally, and small-scale women and men farmers contribute to as much as 32% of the world's food, the negative impact in our production capacities further contribute to the weakening food security in our societies. And then the inequities that the current food system brings whether it be in production, processing, marketing, trading, and consumption of food has made family farmers feel disempowered. But family farmers, especially collectively through our associations, organizations, groups, and cooperatives, we are key actors. As farmers, our multifunctionality allows us to act holistically on various relevant aspects of sustainable development. We produce most of the world's food, in particular the food consumed by the rural and urban poor. We preserve biodiversity, we manage natural resources and ecosystems, we preserve and share traditional knowledge, and we contribute to the resilience of people and ecosystems. Let us cite several examples. Last year, the FAO's Forest and Farm Facility has enabled us to facilitate the establishment of 10 nas national young farmers committees in 10 countries, who in turn developed their strategic plans, which included advocacy for pro-young farmers legislation, as well as to provide small funds to start up selected small businesses. In Cambodia, 22 young vegetable producers were given training on marketing and as a result, have increased their incomes by selling their organic vegetables to a partner agriculture cooperative. And in Nepal, 18 young tea farmers were given training on horti silvi pastoral integration system and were given kiwi and tea seedlings. And the young farmers intercrop this with chili, cardamom, beans, 
and lentil, and they have also reported increases in income. In Philippines, 64 young farmers were trained on integrated diversified organic farming systems and were encouraged to get vegetable seedlings from the government's agriculture office. The youth embarked on vegetable gardens as well as native chicken raising within the rice farms and have reported increased diversity and greener foods on their dining tables. Also, last year, one of the recipients of the Ramon Magsaysay Awards, which is the Nobel Prize equivalent in Asia, was Mr. Roberto Balion or Kadodoy, as we know him. He is a fisher folk who, under his leadership, was able to organize first his co fisher folks in his village, then later the fisher folks in his whole town, and he led them in planting mangroves for reforestation to increase the fish stock in, in, their, in their municipality. And, and they are now currently managing 500 hectares of fisheries resources that serve as shelter for the aquatic animals. And they have reported improved fish harvest for members from an average of 1.5 kilos per fishing trip of eight hours to as much as seven kilograms or like thrice, thrice as much no, of harvest in just, in just three to five hours or twice as less amount of time spent. Now thus, we are very happy with the report that is being launched today. It also confirms and support a research report launched last year, which is Ceres 2030, which recommended financing that empowers the excluded. And we all need these reports and researches that point to the effectiveness and efficiency of locally led actions by organizations and cooperatives of family farmers to provide more and better financing so that we can perform our key roles in transforming food systems and giving dignity back to family farmers. Back to you, Ebony. I hope I answered your question. You absolutely did, Esther. Thank you so much. I think you've really outlined the rationale for locally led action in the context of small scale family farmers. And I really like your framing of returning dignity to these local actors. I think that's a really important point. Um, later on, perhaps it would be good to um, unpack a little bit about what you said around the funding that was provided to farmers and farming businesses to support legislative changes, access to market, access to markets, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it would be good to unpack that a little bit more in the Q&A session. So I think that links closely to some of the recommendations in the report and some of the emerging trends we're seeing as well in this space. So thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting that with us. Um, I'd now like to turn to Simongale Mswelli, the Senior Manager of the Youth Leadership Program at the Africa Wildlife Foundation. Uh, Simongale will speak about the unique challenges that young people face in accessing finance for nature and some reflections on the COP15 finance discussions so far. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ebony, for the invitation and good morning, everyone. Um, it is known that young people today make up a very significant proportion of the world population. In Africa alone, it's estimated that about 70% of the population is under the age of 35, that is children and youth. And their commitment to climate action, biodiversity is not questionable. We have seen it through advocacy efforts and we've seen it through uh, restoration initiatives into recycling initiatives and so on. While they continue to do this work, there's a lot of challenges that they face, and some of them are actually reflected in, in, in the report. One of them is that assessing finance is not simple, right? <laughs> there's a lot of requirements, and rightfully so, that include that you have a registered organization, have up-to-date bank accounts, financial statements, annual NGMs. These are all needed requirements, but for a lot of youth networks on the ground, which are often hard to meet. So basically from that step, you get in a situation where there are organizations doing tangible work on the ground, but because they don't meet those requirements and there's no support mechanisms for them to, then they don't have access um, um, to the finance. In that way, they are in no position to compete with 
bigger established organization and they are often left to compete for other forms of funding which are usually relatively smaller in amount because they are put for youth um, um, organization. But another point for me in my experience uh, with working with youth networks that makes it hard for youth to retain and use uh, the funding without frustration is the one of protocols for accounting. Uh, I once worked in a project where we were supporting uh, young people who are engaging in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework way early in 2019 where there were consultation meetings. Now, in our context of where I was uh, working, you don't have trains where you get an invoice that you took a train and can account for it. There's no flights for distances from one city to another. You are left with forms of transport that in South Africa, we call it Ikumbi. In Kenya, they call it Matatu. It's not a system where you booked online you go first time, first safe. You can stop it anywhere in the road. You just raise your hand, you get it, and you end. So things like that, where you can't necessarily get an invoice <laughs> and go back and say, this is how the money was used in the accounting. So there is a need to adapt to some of these protocols and maybe if not adapting them, to strengthen the national and local institutions to be able to find alternatives ways of accounting. And this is something that is also reflected in, in, in the report. But of course, it's not all doom and gloom. We do have case studies or examples where youth networks have partnered with established organizations so that they co-apply for funding or they get hosted under the organization organization. While that works, in some instances, of course, there's power dynamics, because it means the youth network it does not have the sole power, right, of deciding how the resources are being used and, and, and so on. But we've also had partners that have adapted their systems to ensure that they're suited into the local level. So for me, all of these experiences are key to take into account uh, the COP15 of the CBD is going to be setting the tone for how we do conservation and fund conservation going forward and must reflect all of these things. It's a key milestone, but of course, it's not the only one. The Stockholm Plus 50 that we are in is one of those platforms. There's going to be other platforms coming in in November and so on. So it's very important that these platforms start aligning with this reality of the need to get funding to the ground and recognizing the challenges and the different context that exist everywhere in the world and specifically in Africa, the region where I come from and I've had experience of working with youth from different countries. So thank you so much, um, Ebony. Thank you so much, Simangile. I think you touched on such important points there, particularly this access piece. I think what stood out for me from what you described is that not only is it challenging for young people to access the finance once they have access to the accounting, the reporting, et cetera, is a big challenge as well. It's not set up necessarily to reflect the local context. Um, and I think that's a really great connection to one of Eureka's earlier points around sort of looking at the systems and processes and working out where the challenges might be in those in terms of delivering the funding. Um, so thank you very much for your reflections. Um, so folks, we're going to now do a quick audience poll before we move to hear from our third final speakers our three final speakers, sorry. Um, I'd like you to reflect on what you've heard Esther and Simongali mention just now. Um, and Juliet, I don't know if it's possible to get the poll up um, for people to have a look at. What we would really like you to uh, share with us is your thoughts on where you think leaders need to prioritise their efforts in terms of delivering or moving towards greater support for locally led action. I want to caveat this by saying that the five recommendations need to all happen hand in hand. It's not a sort of shopping list that you can pick or choose. You, we need to kind of see traction against all of these areas. But as we move further through the decade of action, and particularly over the next one or two years, I'd be really interested to see where people think that leaders should initially prioritise some of their efforts in order to uh, really strengthen that agency and decision making over finance for local actors. So I will leave this here just for a moment. And I will also say that um, your choices here will inform the framing of our side event next week at Stockholm Plus 50, where we'll get much deeper into some aspects of the report. So very much look forward to seeing what comes through. 
can see we've got a few. Well, it's looking quite balanced, actually. Um, I'll leave it just 10 more seconds until everyone's had the chance to respond. I think we've probably stabilised our responses. Okay, so what I was hoping at this point is that there might be one or two standouts, but actually, as you can see, there's it's fairly even across the board. Though, actually, I mean, there is obviously a, a front runner, which is this point around strengthening investments in national and local institutions. Um, and I think that was, you know, very much aligned to what Esther was saying before as well. So it would be good to return to that point in the Q&A session after our next three speakers have spoken. Uh, so, folks, thank you very much for answering that poll. And do keep your questions coming in the Q&A function. And if there are questions that you've already seen put in there, please upload those if you'd like to see those answered. Um, so we're now going to move to our three speakers um, from government, from global funds and from multilateral development banks. Um, we've heard from Esther and Simongali a number of things around, you know, really the rationale for locally led action around improving access to looking at the systems and how they can be more reflective of local circumstances. We are very lucky to have three leaders with us today from government and institutions who are really doing some great work to shift more support behind locally led action. And I just want to say that this isn't easy and there's no silver bullet. So, the, so their efforts and their experiences are really critical to hear and to reflect on throughout this journey. We're going to hear from each of them, including their response to what they've heard so far, um, but also where they're seeing some of the positive changes within their organisations um, in terms of the shift towards more locally led action. So we'll first um, invite Terence Hay Eby who's the program advisor for the Jeff Small Grants program implemented by UNDP. Terence, great to have you here and, and over to you. Thank you so much, Ebony, for the opportunity to address uh, the audience today. Um, so uh, along with the Stockholm Plus 50 anniversary this year, another uh, key milestone is the 30th anniversary of the GF. Um, so uh, 1992 was the year in Rio when the the various Rio conventions and the, the GEF as the financial mechanism came into being. And uh, we'll be celebrating over the next six months uh, many of the achievements of uh, the Small Grants Program, which uh, roughly reflects um, uh, a total investment of a, a close to a billion dollars from the GF, which is about 4% for um, projects which are really at the local level um, that are uh, through NGOs, through youth, through Indigenous peoples, uh, women-led projects, and so on, um, in 133 countries. Um, but I think the really interesting thing uh, in, in relation to the report is if we go back to 1992, the debate at the time with the donors was, you know, can these local actors, can civil society make a difference for the, the big uh, uh, challenges of the um, of uh, the, the different global environmental problems of biodiversity and climate change. And so the SGP started as a pilot program in 35 countries for to see whether these um, CSO-led actions would be uh, successful. And I think what, what's been really fascinating to see is that although this uh, financial mechanism goes to uh, local actors, um, non-governmental actors, it's been the interest from governments to um, uh, participate in the program, which has uh, increased steadily over the years, um, to the point that uh, now the the governments that uh, that don't have a program are quite uh, keen to 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 be uh, to, to catch up and participate. And one of the reasons for this is is outlined in the report. So the reference to building trust through uh, downward accountability and devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level is exactly what the SGP has done. So for example, all of the grants that are, that are approved uh, through SGP are done at the national level uh, through a, a multi-stakeholder uh, national steering committee with a non-governmental majority with, uh, with uh, youth focal points, gender focal points, indigenous people's involvement. And, um, and with the also with the involvement of, of, of the government, but this is a shared um, decision making at the, the national level and, and, and we can even go further uh, down to the municipal or the landscape level to to um, uh, get proposals, so I think this speaks to one of the key uh, points in the report. Um, the 
use of national languages uh, to facilitate access to finance has been another principle uh, that since Mangele was talking about. Um, we've also experimented with, with uh, taking risks with uh, other formats for, for uh, grant making, including participatory video and oral proposals and, and monitoring using uh, uh, photo technologies and things like that. So I think it, it, this question of the risk appetite of, of donors to um, uh, uh, work with uh, local actors is, is a very a critical point we can discuss in this panel. Um, there's often a perception that uh, there are higher risks um, because of the maybe uh, inability to report on, on results. And I think um, where UNDP is now heading in terms of its local action work is to uh, review the, the way in which um, these uh, demand-driven um, uh, programs can uh, take you know, uh, calculated uh, risks in terms of the fiduciary uh, checks and balances to uh, work with local actors um, where uh, not everything is codified in a project document before you start a project. So in a demand-driven program, you need to see a certain um, emergence of, of, um, of the types of results that you want to see. So not everything can be put in the log frame beforehand. And so um, the direction that UNDP is going is towards looking at, at systems design and then looking at how experimentation can really uh, address some of these uh, wicked sustainable development problems. Uh, the, 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 the solution isn't always obvious uh, from an expert-led uh, lens, but if you crowd in through uh, experimentation with, with multiple um, uh, different uh, local actors, it, it's, it's likely that you will, you will reach a solution to some of those harder to solve uh, uh, problems. So I'll stop there, Ebony, and uh, hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Terence. Some really practical examples there of um, how to adjust systems to be more um, accessible, applicable, locally um, contextual, which I think is really fantastic. Um, and really heartening as well to hear your direct experience of um, seeing an increase in different um, climate finance, providing governments, et cetera, wanting to work with you and the SGP to get um, more finance to the local level. I think that's really fantastic. Um, and it would be great to get your reflections perhaps later on why you think that is, um, so that we can perhaps help move that even along further. Thank you very much, Terence. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Dora Kudjo, who is a Senior Operations Officer and Program Coordinator for Stakeholder Engagement at the Climate Investment Funds. Um, Dora, I'll just hand straight over to you if you could um, take us through your reflections, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ebony, and congratulations to the IED for the successful, timely launch of this um, report, which summarizes um, the, the, the primary issues underlining the need to provide Indigenous peoples and local communities, the ones who are actually transforming the face of climate action at the, um, at the local community level, the, the, the space to do what they do best. Um, as you mentioned, I work with the Climate Investment Funds um, and over uh, 10.5 um, billion multilateral funds that was established in 2008 um, during what we call the, the financial fuel and food crisis um, under the guidance of the G8 and G20 leaders to drive a, a mechanism of a funding mechanism that enables um, um, middle income and low income countries to push for climate resilient and low carbon development pathways. And so in 2008, we had um, four key programs, clean technology, renewable energy, sustainable forest management, and um, pilot program for climate resilience formed formed at the right time to, at the moment, supporting 72 countries with over 400 investment um, programs globally. Um, specifically, way back in 2008, resonating with some of the key messages that we are hearing this morning or this afternoon, um, that what we call the dedicated grant mechanism was established under the leadership of indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, under the Sustainable Forest Management Program. So a 766 million program, um, within that 80 million was carved, as I said, under the leadership of indigenous people and local community leaders 
to support deploying their knowledge and capacity in directly supporting climate action. And since then, 12 countries are benefiting and are able to support over 600 operations with 250,000 community beneficiaries. What is key about the dedicated grant mechanism? I would say that the key recommendations um, um, or the key issues that have been identified from this um, report resonate clearly with what led to the formation of the dedicated grant mechanism, which is one to create um, the space for convening indigenous people and local communities, um, providing them the platform to showcase their, their leadership in technology, or should I say locally led um, technology-based approaches in advancing climate action. What is also unique about the dedicated grant mechanism is that it's um, somewhat picking on the key element that Terence mentioned, that it's also driving community-led governance, which is here giving the power into the hands of indigenous people and local communities to be able to prioritize their needs, to be able to support implementation of um, key um, forest, conservation by, um, forest conservation and biodiversity needs and also their livelihoods. And most importantly, to be able to effectively monitor the actions and be able to um, effectively report on these, which has been found to be critical to informing policies and decisions around climate action. It's also critical that decisions are made at the local level. There's a decentralized mechanism that ensures that communities are able to identify what is critical to them and they're able to use their own tailored, tested technologies in addressing these in a much more cost effective and efficient manner. It's also critical that as part of the dedicated grant mechanism, there is that established capacity building. Here we're looking at tailored capacity building to meet the needs of the communities that are actually transforming the face of forest conservation and biodiversity um, um, conservation. Um, let me also um, touch on a point that um, Simangali made about youth leadership as part of the dedicated grant mechanism and noting that intergenerational um, exchange of knowledge, the program ensures that um, there's a fellowship um, um, designed to identify youth leaders from their local communities to take the mantle of um, availing themselves of capacity training, leadership, to be able to be the mantle bearers um, going forward. Um, it's also critical to note here, um, and I think um, Ulrika mentioned it, that there are some risks related to the decentralization of um, action on the ground. And it's important to note here that from the, um, from the 10 years, um, close to 10 years implementation of the dedicated grant mechanism, there's that established space for ensuring that communities are able to make their own priorities. One, they're able to follow the decisions that they make and they're able to monitor and report these and it's also critical that they be given the voice. So the dedicated grant mechanism in addition to empowering communities at the local level, is created platforms at the national level and at the global level to ensure that there's that lateral peer-to-peer -peer exchange of knowledge across um, different um, IPLC, or should I say indigenous people and local communities across the 12 countries that are benefiting. And there's also that vertical exchange of knowledge such that they're not speaking to just themselves, but they're also speaking to the ones who are making decisions at the global level in terms of um, allocation of funds and in terms of policies, transformative policies. Let me also uh, make it a point here that has been um, quite established that there's that room for scaling up such tested practices. The dedicated grant mechanism was started as a, as a pilot initiative with only $80 million. Of course, that is being able to make significant impact at the local level. But here, as this report clearly shows, there's the need for scaling up. And was quite um, impressed at the COP26, when a 1.7 billion pledge was made by private and public philanthropies to ensure that IPLCs, indigenous people, local communities can continue to um, um, inform decisions can continue to make impactful results 
in biodiversity conservation and forest restoration. So it's quite expedient that such tested models that, as I said, have been designed by indigenous people, lo local communities, have proven to have been um, an, um, a vehicle for um, transferring funds directly into the hands of local communities, be given the chance to scale up. So I would um, um, indulge that from this conversation and banking on the key elements that have come out of this, um, this study, that the dedicated grant mechanism, of course, which is not the only vehicle available, but it be seen as one that has really pushed the barriers on community-led governance, has pushed the barriers on decentralization of decision-making, empowering local communities and indigenous people. And it's also demonstrated the capacity to be able to lead um, financial management, which is critical, that this DGM model be um, um, given the space to further showcase its work. It's also critical here that the um, every model, be it um, the SGP, be the DGM, further showcases the ability of indigenous people and local communities to partner, not work in silos, but to partner with donors, partner with climate funds, partner with private sector, multi-sector um, um, organizations. And so I would also want to um, conclude by saying that ensuring that they are given this um, space to demonstrate their ability to um, man manage finances, manage decision making is critical to any conversation around the, the support. Let me end on this note. At, um, um, at the, World, um, Forest um, the World Forestry Congress, I sat on a panel and I was quite humbled to learn from some of the IPLC leaders um, um, coming from different regions of the world that the three R's are critical for any means of enhancing um, local level of um, IPLC leadership. That every vehicle that is available should be, should be able to give them the recognition, recognition for the impactful result they're making in climate action. They should be given the space for um, secured rights to lands which is critical for making any sustainable um, 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 investment in forest conservation, landscape restoration. And they will need secured resources, flexible, reliable resources, financing that, is, that enables them to scale up their leadership in climate action. So let me stop here, but very, very privileged to be part of this con um, conversation and happy that again, from um, that little that I've been able to share with you, um, um, some of the lessons garnered definitely are key to driving um, local, le um, local leadership, and that is the cause of our, our meeting this morning. Thank you, and back to you, Ebony. Thank you so much, Dora. There's so much to unpack in what you've just shared with us, and certainly um, from our perspective, there's a lot to be learned from the DGM and the experience that you've had for, for more than 10 years now. Um, and I particularly would like to come back to, towards the end, this point around your experience with really investing in building capabilities at the local level according to needs and how that might have transfer, transformed your relationship with different local actors over the, the years that the DGM has been running. Um, and I think that also touches very much on Terence's point around downward accountability as well. Um, but yeah, fantastic, Dora, thank you so much. Um, folks, we have one final speaker and then we'll move into the Q&A session. If you have, um, a question for any of our speakers, please pop it into the Q&A function, not, not into the chat function, so I can, I can capture it in the Q&A session. Um, but I will now hand over to our, our last but certainly not least speaker, uh, Omer Van Rentehem, a Senior Policy Advisor for Water and Environment in the Inclusive Green Growth Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands to share his reflections, some of the positive trends that he is seeing, and then we will move into the Q&A. Omer, over to you. Thank you very much uh, and a very uh, rich uh, presentations and it's uh, always uh, difficult to be the last. So I would like to focus a bit more on our operational part in the project, not at the general uh, low, glo global level and come up and link it to the recommendations made in the uh, report. And I would call it in, in three uh, teams, invisible, identify and implement. First, invisible. What is important when we monitor climate finance, we monitor the finance and not the LLA side. That's typical for, I think, a lot of organization. And I think LLA is invisible. So for instance, in our program that we supported in Burundi, an agricultural productivity program, there was a strong 
PIP approach. And PIP stands for Integrated Farmer Planning. And when we looked at it a couple of months ago, we said, this is local climate adaptation. This is climate security, but we label it as food security program. So it is not visible as locally led adaptation. It's not treated as such. And we look at it from within our silos. And I think what is invisible lacks recognition and does not get climate finance because it's not labeled as a, as a locally led adaptation type of resilience activity. It shows, I think, how important it is to create awareness on this locally led adaptation in our silos if you want to mobilize finance. It starts there. And I think that is recommendation five, which is very clear. We need to train our staff across our silos on applying LLA. That brings me to identify. Yet, if you don't know what LLA is, how can you identify or appreciate it? And sometimes I see that our evaluations help. For instance, in our water program, when the evaluators of our program concluded in 2017, the management of water activities is very strong, but the local involvement is very weak. So try to do something about it. So we started thinking, and this resulted in a reversing the flow program that started last year and is now identifying areas and organizations to work with at the local level. And our aim is to build on existing multi-stakeholder cooperation in landscapes and catchments and support local communities with their plans, including providing finance to these local plans based on local decision-making and providing also a broader, longer-term perspective of, 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 at least, uh, of at least of 10 years. So that's where we are piloting. And that's, I think, related to recommendation one, increase the quantity and pilot with it. And I think it's also the DGM that has a lot of, for us to learn on this. Key will be in this sense, a hub, a hub as a kind of civil society, community-based organization in the region that organize and support the stakeholder initiative. So that's providing a platform recommendation for, we want to pilot with that. And the big challenge, and I heard it before, is the accountability, how to do this. Recommendation three, which is here, how can you really get access to finance? And here, I think for us, there's a lot to learn. And I like to share with the previous speakers the experience that they have so that we can better identify how to apply LLA in practice. The last, the third, implementation. Let me briefly tell you a bit about our recent plans that we want to work on in relation to our existing programs. First, we have 25 strategic partnerships and consortia of NGOs and CSOs under the name of Power of Voices. They focus on lobby advocacy, at several levels and they all work within local communities and organizations on the IPLC. But, and nine of these partnerships work on justice, the just climate action, on food security and sustainable value chains. But only in one of these consortia, five of the six organizations have endorsed the LLA principles. We think there's an enormous group of organizations that we can link to these LLA principles. So we want to facilitate this peer learning among all these organizations that we are already working with in strategic partnerships to strengthen this, build a group of support that is like a critical mass. And we hope that this will bring local level and create a stronger voice from the local level to our climate diplomacy and climate funds managers. So testing, in fact, uh, recommendation two, accreditation of IPLC organizations might be part of it. The second action we are working on is an environmental assessment facility for local organizations so that they can apply for financial support to participate effectively in formal environmental assessment process in their country. Because from work we did with WWF and IUCN, we learned that it's very effective to get the voice of civil society at the local level being part of the formal programming. And it, I think it's a bit testing recommendation five, institutional strengthening. And it's using the, leg the legal frameworks in the countries and we hope that this might result in planning that can end up in NDCPs being eligible, eligible for climate finance. It's experiment. We just started. And the, the last one is, I think, the experience we have with landscape programs that is quite vast. And here the challenge is bring it together with the LLA community. That's what we want to do, because the LLA community and the landscape communities, according to what we see, are two different communities. If they are stronger united, if they work together, we think we build a stronger case for financing by donors, MDBs, and private finance. So this range of invisible, identify, and implement brings me to a positive change, which I see across donors to direct 
more influence and control to the local level. But first, a critical remark on the report. The report deals with nature, pe people, nature, and climate. But water, one of the most vital ecosystem services, is overlooked in this report. And why do I say this? Because this weekend I was at the first meeting of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water that the Netherlands convened, and that is pro going to produce an independent review of the economics of water. An important new scientific act insight that came up last weekend was the rapidly changing global hydrological cycle. And this is threatening, threatening to human well-being, resilience of local societies in the face of these rising shocks. They will tackle this. They will pr produce a report and societal dialogues and an agenda for action to be presented at UN 2023 Water Conference in New York next year. And I am sure the call for local action will be a strong one on that conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Omar. It's so, it's so refreshing to sort of hear your, um, your approach to really looking internally and seeing what you can do as a donor to really support locally led action, how you're looking at your different programs, your activities, and also wanting to share that peer-to-peer -peer learning both with other governments, but also with other organizations that you work with. I think that's really fantastic. Um, and it's a good point that water is not a strong feature of this report. Um, and I think as we move this conversation forward, we will want to start collecting more and more case studies of where locally led action to support water security, et cetera, at the local level is, is much stronger. So let's work together on that and, and make sure that we capture that important message, particularly, as you say, heading into the conference next year. Um, so fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, folks, we've heard from our five fantastic speakers. We've got a number of questions that are coming through in the Q&A box, which are really excellent. What I would like to do is invite all of our speakers to come back onto camera and to um, back on into this virtual um, plenary uh, so we can commence the Q&A session for today. What I would like to do is in a moment, give the space to Simangeli and Esther to come back in and to pick up any key points that they've heard through the three speakers that have just come. But before I do that, I think what might be helpful is to turn to a couple of the questions that have come through in the Q&A function. I think in particular, Terence, I can see that you've already answered a couple of them, which is super great. I wonder if you could particularly reflect on um, perhaps Claire Shakia's question. I realise Claire is one of the authors of the report um, around, I guess, what proportion of your funds are dispersed in the ways that you described around um, the innovation around applications for grants and monitoring, uh, what some of those barriers are. And, and also as well, if, if there's a place where you're starting to share those messages, both within the GEF or UNDP or elsewhere. Terence, if you could come in on that, that would be fab. Yeah. So. Uh, in terms of the, the formats for proposals, obviously uh, written proposals for legal reasons are still um, required in terms of signatures, but I think um, the, uh, and I put into the, into the, uh, the answer in the chat box there, the, um, the technologies are now really uh, rapidly uh, evolving to the point that, uh, for example, in the small island developing states context for remote outer islands, um, monitoring projects through you know, photo monitoring with, with smartphones is increasingly um, uh, cheap and, and, and easy. So I think that the, the, the necessity for having, say, a written report um, can be um, you know, reviewed. Um, last year at the IUCN World Conservation Congress, we were talking about um, other ways of, of, um, of you know, certifying these types of um, you know, reports, maybe even types of sort of blockchain type things um, are coming on, on, on stream. But um, the point that uh, Omar was, was raising about uh, aggregation of, of small projects at the landscape level is something I'd really like to um, uh, stress. So. Um, in UNDP, we've tried various models to have multiple small grants for uh, protected areas for socio-ecological production landscapes with different donors with uh, Japan um, through um, their leadership in the CBD with the Satoyama Initiative. And I think one of the big challenges, and then this links to Esther's point about working with small farmers, is, is how do we aggregate the scale for this missing middle of finance? It's, it will be often here at at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues or similar events that small grants are all well and good, but how do uh, farmers access this sort of next level of, of finance? How do indigenous peoples access the green 
uh, climate fund. Um, so the, 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 in your report, there's a reference to enhanced direct access. Um, this is something I think that uh, last year during the Gobishana conference that IED organizes with, um, uh, uh, with various networks, um, we had a panel on um, the way the adaptation fund works with the national entities like in Micronesia, the Micronesia Conservation Trust. So I think these types of uh, 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 sort of mid-level uh, institutions at the national level that are staffed by nationals from those countries um, that have sometimes risen up through the, the, the CSO capacity building provides a type of scaling effect where, where finance can go from the small to the medium to, and um, eventually uh, in UNDP, we're looking at blended finance, of course, to de-risk other forms of, of um, you know, non-grant based uh, uh, finance, which uh, is, is very needed for uh, farmers and for other uh, production landscape uh, contexts. And so how do we do that at the, at the landscape level is something that uh, I totally concur with Omer that, that this is something the CBD is looking at. Um, uh, so I'll stop there. Um, and I see lots of hands. Thanks, Evelyn. Thanks, Terence. There's actually quite a few questions coming in on, um, I guess, advice that you or others might have to donors around adjusting some of these processes that you're obviously have thought through so far. Um, so we might try and get onto that a little bit later if we can. But for the moment, I'd like to bring um, first Simon Gile and then Esther in for some uh, reflections from their side. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll refer to the question on uh, whether uh, the approaches that uh, DGM and SGP have uh, presented today are kind of what um, um, you need. I would say, uh, although I'll have to read more into them, I will say yes. I will pick at specific information that they give that I thought is very powerful and is what is needed. Um, uh, Terence touched uh, the need to what they're exploring in expanding the types of uh, means of verifications or means of um, uh, accounting that they are adopting. And that is great because as mentioned, sometimes what is the mainstream way does not work in the particular context and this is and this is good i know earlier on i made an example with a very tiny example which is about transportation but this goes sometimes even with big purchases right when you need to buy equipment for a project communities tend to have very skilled people who can produce the quality that you need but it's just a local mama or baba in the village who does it. So if you procure that equipment, there is not that kind of an invoice that you get elsewhere. So just adding to this um, um, example, that it doesn't just extend to simple things like transportation, but things that include procurement of uh, devices and, and, and all of that. So it's very great to see that there's that exploration of what other ways do we verify things without having to rule them out and say, you know, this doesn't count. One point I will touch on that Dora mentioned was the one of what they do in capacity building and investing in leadership. For me, I think this is really key. So often in the projects I've been involved in, there's money for the hardcore activity itself, but the reality is that the work is being done by people who can come with the skills that are needed, but are not all rounded. And for me, building the leadership of people is part of the sustainability plan because as a project years later as we've seen you leave so if you haven't built the capacity and this leadership that is needed locally for people to continue to operate beyond your presence there beyond your eye that is watching over how things are happening then we're not gonna have sustainability where else the issues that we are dealing with are very intergenerational in, in nature. They are not solved by one generation. So I will say, yes, these are responding to some of the challenges, especially with the two uh, examples that um, I've given. And I look forward to engaging more with these um, uh, partners and seeing how, how that goes and we share lessons. So thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much. I'll hand straight over to Esther at this point. Please go for it. Thank you very much, Ebony. It was very interesting and very promising to hear from our three experts and what they are proposing are, I think, good also to explore. But let us share what is our key ask 
uh, to finance providers to help finance flow to the local level for small scale farmers in Asia. So two weeks ago, I was at the World Forestry Congress in Seoul, Korea. And in one panel session on rural financing, I met the woman leader of a national community forest user association. She said that during the design phase of a proposal to be submitted by the government to the GCF, their organization was involved in the consultation process with their leaders providing inputs into the design. But after that, they have not heard about the project. They just read in the papers that it was approved and implementation is starting without them getting involved. So we got to think, we are concerned not only with the money, but where will the money flow and who decides what to do with the money? Thus, our key ask is direct financing to farmers' organizations as part of a window, window in the bigger window for climate financing, and the inclusion of farmers' organizations and cooperatives in the governance and implementation structures of financing institutions and of project design and implementation processes. Good models in the governance structure exist, like in the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program with three CSO representatives in its steering committee and with some funding given to them to do its mandate with its constituencies. The FFF Advisory Committee, the IFAD Farmers Forum processes with grant window for producer and farmers organizations. One possibility we are exploring is the establishment of a farmer's resiliency trust funds that can be managed by experts in banking and finance, but also with representatives of farmers' organizations in its steering committee. We want to de-risk investments, and we ask that public capital be used to de-risk investments into agroecology and regenerative business models. And the risking means supporting farmers' organizations and cooperatives at global, national, and local levels to be strong institutions. They can partner with public development banks. They can serve as loan guarantors and business development specialists. We can partner with governments so we can be service providers and act as advocates who can study and make policy proposals, as submit policy proposals upon due consultation with the local people and with donors and development partners like here in this round table, we can continue organizing, federating and building the social awareness of farmers about their rights. And as what uh, uh, Simangali said, building their capacities uh, as, as key stakeholders in climate, uh, climate change uh, actions. As a proposed shift in mindset, we ask that everyone treat farmers through their organizations and cooperatives as equal partners, not just beneficiaries, not just victims, but as equal partners at the heart and center of the transformation process for sustainable development, give us adequate financing to do our work as service providers, as responsible citizens and stakeholders in our country and in our communities. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Esther. And thanks, Simongali. Oh, that's brilliant, Dora. I was going to bring you in actually on, on this point around, um, I guess, investing in building the capacities of communities, but also sometimes at the national level to really push for stronger support for locally led action. Um, you mentioned that the DGM has been doing this um, since its inception. And I wonder if there's some reflections that you can have that you could share on your experience in how you did that, but also, I guess, the, the benefits that you and others are seeing in terms of um, investing at that local level. Because as, as I think it was Simon Gillet was saying, it's not just about funding the activity itself. It's about building local leadership, um, supporting local governance, et cetera. So, Dora, I don't know if you can come in and share some reflections on that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the point that Smangli has made and also um, echoed by Esther. Clearly, as I said, um, the model, the, de the dedicated grant mechanism model ensures that local communities are able to identify their own capacity gaps as opposed to some funding agency or donor agency coming in to give them what, um, what they think is no. But the deal is to help them identify 
what their gaps are and to provide tailored solutions that meet their specific needs. For example, in the Ghana um, dedicated grant mechanism, it was um, communities found it critical to um, um, be uh, um, availed of agroforestry and climate smart cocoa practices which is of course um, dovetailing other experiences and lessons from countries that are also doing say um, 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 shade cocoa plantations and other um, value chain addition. So it was um, specifically, specifically to their needs. In Brazil, there was a, a specific look at the red plus and the indigenous people and traditional communities. So designing um, um, analytical work capacity training that responds to that need and at the global level, it's also critical to be looking at issues on stakeholder mapping, which is, becomes essential in terms of even being able to identify the um, um, categories of stakeholders that are critical to decisions at the local, national, and global level. Again, uh, with the dedicated grant mechanism, the design ensures that communities are able to, first of all, as I said, they identify what they need, but most importantly, get the resources and the, the training to respond to that particular need. It's also important for me to um, mention here that when it comes to that inclusivity agenda, um, we are not only looking at men versus women, but being able to respond to the specific um, gender needs. And um, if I may quickly pick on a, um, a, a value that was noted in the report, that 20% um, 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 was uh, recognized as women's um, inclusion. But here with the um, grant mechanism and by being able to respond to local needs, we realized that women are actually, the number of women participating in training have actually increased. And at the moment, we can uh, mention 24% that all sub projects have been awarded to women led initiatives. And women comprise 25% of the national steering committees, as in the groups that are making priorities and decisions at the local level. To even better support this, um, we've also been able to carry out specific studies within the climate investment funds that looked at the um, traditional knowledge and technologies and their contribution to climate solutions, and also studies specifically the role of women as, as even being the custodians of traditional knowledge, ensuring that they're well empowered and well able to transfer this knowledge laterally and vertically. So again, each country using their own national steering committee, national executing agency model, are able to prioritize their own needs and most importantly, are able to maximize use of the available resources um, provided um, them to be able to plug into those um, um, capacity gaps and which we have identified as extremely critical to sustaining project results beyond the DGM um, window. Within the CIF, we're also looking at scaling up um, after 10 years of implementation, it's critical that within um, our nature, people, and climate program, a new program that is building on our sustainable forest management and climate resilience work, we are and again ensuring that we keep the DGM as a viable vehicle for continued provision of direct financing to local communities to support their, um, their um, technology, local community-led actions in climate. So um, Ebony, let me stop there. I believe there are more questions that we could touch on. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Dora. I actually just want to stay quickly with you and Terence, if that's okay, and then I'll move to Omer and Eureka. I, I'm quite keen to get your thoughts just very briefly on, so obviously the SGP and the, F, the DGM, all the acronyms, um, are a kind of component of the work that um, UNDP, Jeff and um, CIF have. And of course, the new NPC that you mentioned as well, Dora. I wonder if you're seeing appetite in some of the other funds and programs that you also engage with across your institutes to also move towards more locally led approaches. Um, Terence, I wonder if you can reflect from the UNDP side and then Dora, just quickly on the CIF side as well. Yeah, so the yeah, short answer is yes, that UNDP is trying to build on the experience with the GF to really build more of these local action components into the portfolio of larger projects, um, whether it's for uh, climate or ecosystems, biodiversity or energy. So I'll give you one example. Um, the Right Energy Partnership, um, which is a, a, an initiative of Indigenous peoples under the 
um, uh, the high level political forum on the SDGs, uh, identifying their own energy solutions, which are things to do with micro hydro um, and uh, solar and, and biogas and things which uh, 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 approaches which they uh, design themselves. Um, which are not necessarily defined by uh, uh, experts from uh, the outside, and this is a, this is critical in terms of the, the point about you know where you know what is expertise. You know, what, is it something that uh, can you design a project um, in a very nice log frame, but then find out that it's not uh, culturally appropriate? So this question of of of, of the uh, deep listening. So in UNDP, we're moving towards. Um, uh, these uh, in the uh, uh, role of UNDP on uh, uh, integration of the SDGs and accelerator labs for the SDGs to really find ways of listening uh, to the culturally appropriate solutions. Once you've done that, uh, I think then the question of the scale and the finance that Esther was talking about, uh, if you know the farmer associations in, in Asia are, are grouping at, at the landscape level, or the indigenous peoples have identified their micro hydro solutions, then the, the, the next question would then be how do you then blend and, and de-risk these other? Um, so, so in short, basically, uh, we're find, trying to find ways of, of integrating components of demand-driven, locally-led um, you know, uh, solution uh, mapping into these bigger uh, projects rather than treat them like a like a, a bank investment where everything is is, is written in in the in the in the ledger and i think the the green climate fund is 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 one of the the uh, target uh, funds globally that indigenous peoples are looking at for something a little more flexible along these lines so back over to you ebony thank you thanks terence that's really fantastic to hear and really exciting actually um dora do you have reflections on the same question Absolutely. Um, definitely. Um, one thing that quite stands out is that for um, the climate fund, the investment funds, we are always exploring spaces for um, partnering with the other uh, funds and therefore creating that level um, ground for continued learning, continued exchange, continued building on the lessons and experiences. So yes, there is a room for us to further cross fertilize. Um, I would also um, want to um, uh, note that as I mentioned, within the SIF itself, we are scaling up with the, uh, our new programs. And Terence, if I may also touch on a point that you made, um, from our continued dialogue with indigenous people and local communities globally, we understand more and more that yes, there's, it's not only in sustainable forest management, but there's room for looking at renewable energy integration um, opportunities that further provide space for um, um, local communities to um, take on and run with. So yes, there's room for expanding the, the scope for where indigenous people and local communities can lead in climate action beyond um, sustainable forest management, beyond um, biodiversity conservation. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention a point that um, um, Madam Esther made. Yes, um, within the CIFS um, governance model, we ensure that um, um, indigenous people and local communities alongside other non-state actors have a pivotal role in the decisions around priorities, around um, 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 allocation of resources. And quite pleased that we have one farmer association leader from um, Bangladesh being one of our key um, leaders in helping advance our decisions and planning around um, sustainable forest management and um, our, our um, climate, broader climate resilience agenda. So let me land on the point that yes, we fully agree that there is space for cross fertilization um, um, with other funds. And we always um, and, um, um, look out for such opportunities. And Terence, maybe I'll touch base with you after this, but we are looking at how to even better um, establish some levels of partnerships around how the Climate Investment Fund is supporting indigenous people um, and, and local communities and how that um, the, the GEF is also driving this business and whether there's room for that um, you know, stronger force um, 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 bilaterally. So I'm happy to take this conversation further, but thank you again, um, Ebony. Let me pass it back to you. Thanks so much, Dora. So fantastic to hear from both of you these plans. Um, uh, and certainly there's a lot of appetite to see this type of thing happen and expand across your institute. So yeah, wish you the best of luck with, with the efforts that sound fantastic.
Um, I want to now switch gears and bring in our government representatives. I'm mindful that we've only got nine minutes left in the event, and I do want to leave a few minutes for some closing remarks. There's a great question that's come through on the Q&A function from Jodi Ann Wang, and it's very much around the G20 and how to leverage the discussions and the priorities of Indonesia as the G20 president to really sharpen attention on getting finance down to the local level. I appreciate Sweden and the Netherlands aren't members of the G20, um, but I would invite you, Eureka and Omer, to reflect on if you think that there's a space to push for greater ambition for locally led action through processes like the G20. And I would also expand that question and just invite you both to, um, I guess, think through if there are certain things that you're doing within your governments um, to promote locally led action across your domestic departments as well, um, thinking about people, nature, climate, and of course, water that Omer mentioned as well. Um, Eureka, I'll bring you in first. Thank you, Ebony, and uh, what a rich discussion. It's been uh, fantastic just to, to listen uh, to what everyone presented. Just on, the, on, on that question uh, on locally led action and, and possibilities to push that through G20 and other fora, I, I would say yes. I mean, there, there, of course, there, there must be room and there must be also be an interest, I believe, uh, in, in uh, pushing that further. Um, now, uh, on your second question, Ebony, what was, what, what was that? Uh, the second question was around, um, I guess, if CEDA are also working domestically within other, other departments within the Swedish government to promote locally led action and really see that transition translate into domestic action within Sweden. Oh, uh, well. yeah. So you mean in a, in a broader context of Sweden? Yes, we do. And I, I think what, what is also interesting with um, at least how we work with Swedish development corporations, not only CEDA, involved uh, in in the work we there are lots of agencies of course uh engaged in in sweden and also pushing for for and supporting projects and locally led action and i was thinking of, of the work done for example by the swedish environment protection agency uh by the swedish a and an energy agency and others so i think it's just uh and when you ask that question, it also reminds me of, of the importance, I think, as that CEDA has in terms of uh, having continuing this dialogue also with the, the foreign ministry, of course, but also with other actors within development cooperation, not least civil society actors in Sweden and others. So we have that broad engagement on locally led action uh, as, as of Sweden, broader than, than more than CEDA alone. So, yes. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that at this moment. Thanks. Brilliant. Fantastic, Eureka. Omer, same question for you. Well, first, regarding the attending, I think, yeah, that is a perfect opportunity to have a push. And the uh, Netherlands is present at, at uh, G20. So I think this offers a good opportunity uh, to bring it to the fore and maybe use the uh, Adaptation Champions Group uh, to prepare it and to bring a message there. I think that's something to, uh, to convene. And the second, whether it's domestically, I think there's, uh, there is in the, in the, let's say, in renewable energy, there's uh, interest in, in the domestic, locally led uh, sphere. It's a bit complicated sometimes and it's slow, but it's, uh, it's now moving uh, forward. But also in the uh, planning, in the local planning, I think there was a, uh, that's becoming an issue in the Netherlands because uh, the local planning has been devolved to the local level, but it needs to include, let's say, the, the water and agricultural organizations. And that is gradually moving to a new direction to have it a stronger locally uh, planning uh, aspect. But, uh, and that is, uh, that is growing. So these are the areas where something is happening. And I think, yeah, relating to our general programming, I think it's, it's important to, to break the silos down and to have this, this adaptation perspective being much more linked to the different programs, because I see uh, adaptation is something that is really linked to all these different aspects. And uh, that's the complication which I see is, uh, is, is stopping, for instance, also the finance, because it's, it's a bit related to different sectors. And it, as long as it's sectoral finance, you will forget to look at, uh, for instance, the broader uh, resilience perspective. And I think that's we should make a strong case. And I heard very interesting examples uh, uh, last uh, uh, last hour, and I think there is really a lot to learn. And let us share the learning and link this to this landscape. Because I heard 
that several times that that is kind of the, 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 the entity, the spatial entity where to look at because here people, nature, climate and water come together. Brilliant, Thank, thanks Omer. It's, yeah, it's really great to hear these two reflections from government as well, both work, you know, silo busting as we, as I used to call it when I was in the Australian government, working across different departments to really break down those silos and progress this action together. Um, and of course, you know, and my oversight, I'm so sorry, I, I um, overlooked that the Netherlands were part of a G20 discussion, my apologies there. But you also mentioned the Champions Group on Adaptation Finance, which Sweden and the Netherlands are both part of. There's also the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance and a number of other mechanisms that I think are, are starting to push um, or turn the dial in the right direction um, and can really support greater uptake of locally led action. Um, folks, we are just about at the end of our time of our 90 minutes together. Before I hand over to Eureka to provide some brief closing remarks, I just wanted to see if Esther or Simon Gilly would like to come in for any final comments, just very briefly. Esther, uh, Esther, you go first and then Simon Gilly. Yes, uh, thank you, Ebony. This is really a very interesting conversation. For our part in AFA, we, you know, we are not uh, very active in the COP processes because we really don't know how to get there. And we felt that before agriculture was not in the agenda, but now, especially with, with, with the last COP and with the upcoming COP, we know that agriculture is very back in the agenda. And we really want to be very active also in the processes down at the local, national, and at the regional level. So I'm really looking at the people here and we are hopefully hoping we will have a short capacity building project on climate financing and how it can it can we can make it work at the local level with farmers. So please if we, we could contact you in in a month or so to to give us some inputs and and um, knowledge you know, about how, how we can unpack this and how we can understand this better for our own action. We will appreciate it. Thank you. I yep. myself on mute there, apologies. I think that was a great call to action for us all to stay connected and to share lessons, support each other through this journey. I think it's really important and, and let's definitely stay in touch. Um, Simon Gillet. Yep, thank you so much. So from my side, this report covers a lot of experiences and thoughts that as youth and African CSOs in Africa have been mentioning, but they were all all over the place. So thanks to the team that puts it together, because <laughs> it gave it a more targeted um, 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 focus. This is one of the points that through the African CSOs Biodiversity Alliance, that the African Wildlife Foundation is secretariat of, it's one of the points we've really been pushing for in the post 2020 so this is complementary to that work and i will end by saying um as youth organization we look forward not only to just being beneficiaries of these processes but to shaping the processes as well and being part of strengthening the national and local institutions for delivery of such finance and for uh, efficient reporting Brilliant. Thanks so much, Samigali. We lost you just, I think, in your last two or three words. But as you say, um, you know, really getting rid of the terms like beneficiaries and, and sort of moving towards more equal partnerships um, in terms of driving locally led action. Really important. Thank you, Esther and Samigali, particularly for your reflections today. Um, Eureka, you have the tough task of um, giving just a moment of um, closing remarks before I close this out. So please, yeah. over to you. Thanks, Ebony. I'll try to be quick. Uh, and I think just to start with saying that I think the discussion today has given so much to uh, to complement the report in terms of what, what's in there and how we can uh, dig deeper into these uh, issues. One thing I, I was thinking of when, when listening to everyone is, uh, of course, the importance to learn between each other when it comes to uh, well, organizations that have spoken today, but us as donors and all actors in this, because I think there's a lot in there that we can do uh, with, with sharing those experiences and, and concerns that we have. Um, so that was just one uh, key takeaway. And then I think uh, what was also brought up in, in um, participatory methods is something that we also need to understand better demand-driven programs, uh, I think it was Terence raising that, uh, that not 
everything is there beforehand and that you need to be allowed to experiment and have a systems approach in, in, in tackling things. This is something I, I was, I'm going to be part of a session in Stockholm for on, on peace and development this afternoon uh, on environmental peace building. And that's something that will come up there. And I think in other four as well, the importance of daring as donors also to, to uh, uh, allow partners to experiment and go as, as, uh, as it develops, kind of follow that. Uh, and also, Another thing I, I took with me from today's discussion is, is uh, how uh, it is so important to have communities identify what's important for them and also um, and to be there and, and, uh, and support that. Uh, now, and then uh, also the importance of vertical dialogue. I think that was another thing that came up and I, both horizontal and vertical that we need to think more broadly and in, in how to to um, roll out dialogue with with each other and partners, uh, and uh, also the implementation. Uh, I think it was interesting to hear about landscape pro programming and uh, other ways of working to have this happen in practice. Um, and also, finally, maybe just to say that, um, um, yeah. Uh, that there is a cross fertilization to be done uh, between funds. I think that's something also that that was something I took with me. But also, not the least, to have this what we talked about to, today as a platform for the discussion next week at Stockholm Plus Fifty. Uh, and uh, so this has just been kind of the start of a of a bigger discussion to to come. So thanks uh, to IID for organizing it, for Ebony to to moderating, and also all. Uh, who have spoken today. So many thanks. Thank you so much, Eureka. Um, I'm going to close us out now. I have nothing further to add to what you've said, Eureka. It was a great summary of the discussion. And, you know, as with all of these events, we always wish that we had a whole day to really get into the nitty gritty of some of these topics. But I just want to say a very, very big thank you to all of our speakers um, for your contributions, for your honesty, for your reflections during this discussion. Um, we will, as Eureka said, be convening a, a side event next week at Stockholm Plus 50. It will be hybrid, so even if you're not physically in Stockholm Plus 50 for the meeting, you will be able to join virtually, so we'll make sure that we share those details if you'd like to register for that. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank Juliet, my, my colleague at IID, also for supporting logistics and tech for this event. I've seen a few comments and questions. Um, yes, the recording for this event will be shared with everyone who registered, so please keep an eye out for that and do share it. The recording and the report with... <clears throat> my voice is going, apologies. Do share the recording and the report with um, your networks and those who you think um, will be interested in these issues. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you very much again to our speakers. Thank you to our audience from joining all around the world. And we very much look forward to continuing this discussion with you all. Thank you very much.